Uh, I'm Howard Marks. Uh, I am the president of the Illinois State Society of uh, Washington, D.C. We are honored to host this Black History Month program on the life of Julius Rosenwald, who was born in Springfield, just a few blocks from President Lincoln's home. Eventually, he would make his way to Chicago, where he revolutionized retailing, opening up a cornucopia of consumer goods at affordable prices to all regions of the country, even rural areas far from the department stores of the big cities. As consumers, we are still benefiting, benefiting from his genius. In the name of full disclosure, I have a special pride in Mr. Rosenwald's Sears. My grandfather was a mid-level executive at Sears, headquartered at the same time, at the same time Mr. Rosenwald was the co-owner. My grandfather emigrated from Sweden to Chicago with his parents, and he eventually was offered a well-paying job by Sears when Jews often found it difficult to find corporate work. My father grew up on Holman Avenue in the shadows of the Sears headquarters, that same building that you saw in the movie clip. Some of you may wonder what the Illinois State Society is about. State and territorial societies are civic and social organizations that are unique to the national capital region. We are the oldest of the societies and count President Lincoln as one of our earliest members. In recent years, we have sponsored fantastic inaugural presidential galas for, the like, for those like our own Barack Obama, food events which feature Illinois wines and beers, and scholarships for young men and women from Illinois interning in congressional offices. Please consider, consider joining us. We're also sponsoring this event to celebrate the enactment into law of the Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools Act of 2020. The legislation will begin a process leading to the establishment of a National Park Service site to honor the historic achievements of Mr. Rosenwald. The legislation was introduced to the U.S. Senate by Illinois Senator Dick Durbin and in the House of Representatives by U.S. Representative Danny Davis, who represents the Chicago West Side District, where the original Sears International Headquarters was located. Here is what Mr. Davis, Representative Davis said about this legislation. Julius Rosenwald was very instrumental in bringing together and in cementing relationships between and among various cultures and ethnic communities, especially Blacks and Jewish. A great contributor, a great humanitarian, a great American. Therefore, we need to do everything we can to preserve his heritage, his contributions, and his legacy. Uh, quite a statement, and we thank both Senator Durbin and Representative Davis for the work that they did in pushing this legislation across the finish line. And those that are on the call here today, they were instrumental in setting the table for passage of this legislation. Uh, just a few bookkeeping items. If you have any questions, please do them in the Q&A, not the chat. Please do them in the Q&A. Also, this program is be re being recorded and will appear within 24 hours on the Illinois State Society of Washington, D.C. website. So just go on your search engine and Illinois State Society of Washington, D.C. Uh, and now I'm turning the program over to our moderator, Alan Spears of the National Parks Conservation Association. Alan, thank you. Howard, uh, thank you so much for organizing this program and hosting us today. And uh, for all the folks that are with us, the participants, thank you for joining us. We are going to hear from 
three, perhaps four, if we get an extra appearance being made, esteemed colleagues today uh, who will help us to understand the life and legacy of Julius Rosenwald with a little bit more clarity and perhaps a little bit more uh, inspiration. Uh, they will be providing us with uh, presentations that they have crafted. We hope to be able to entertain your questions, again, using the Q&A function towards the end of the program. And um, we think this is going to be something that is of compelling interest to the folks that are gathered right now. Uh, I wanna start with uh, my friend and my colleague, Dorothy Cantor. And I will read brief bios, all too brief bios for all of our panelists, uh, but you would be able to find through links uh, on the Rosenwald Park campaign website, the full length bios for all of my friends and colleagues. Uh, Dr. Dorothy Cantor, uh, prior to her retirement, was a nationally recognized expert in the decontamination of bioterrorism agents and in preparedness activities responding to and recovering from attacks with weapons of mass destruction, first at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and then at the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. A volunteer for the National Parks Conservation Association for over 30 years, she has served in a number of capacities, including nine years on the Board of Trustees. Thank you, Dorothy. She was a founding member of the Friends of Fort Hunt Park Incorporated and served as its president for three years. She has visited over 300 national park units. Dr. Cantor received a BS in mathematics and a PhD in biophysics from the George Washington University. Dorothy, take us out, please. Thank you, Alan. And thank you, Howard, and many thanks to the Illinois State Society of Washington, D.C. for sponsoring this program. It all began on a sleepy Saturday afternoon in September 2015, when my husband Jerry and I decided almost accidentally to see the documentary entitled Rosenwald by Aviva Kempner, who you will hear from shortly. Although Jewish, I had never heard of Julius Rosenwald. We were both blown away by the film. Learning about his philanthropy and how he helped so many African Americans was just inspiring. At the end of the film, I turned to Jerry and I said, there needs to be a national park for Julius Rosenwald. I did not know then much about Julius Rosenwald, just what I had seen in the film. But as Alan told you, I knew quite a bit about national parks. As he said, uh, as of now, I've been a volunteer for NPCA for 32 years, um, since I was about 14 years old. Um, so, um, and I, I have I've now visited 320 national park units and my, my pace has been slowed dramatically by COVID. I had visited many, many of the natural wonders, the Yellowstone, Shenandoah, Grand Canyon, and Denali National Parks. But I'd also visited quite a number of the historical parks, which comprise two thirds of the national park system. And these, these park units tell the uniquely American story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and I knew that none of the more than 400 specially designated units in the system commemorated the life and legacy of a Jewish American. From that aha moment in 2015 came the campaign to establish the Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools National Historical Park. The first person I spoke to was our wonderful moderator, Alan Sp Beers. And Alan is the head of cultural resources at the NPCA, National Parks Conservation Association. And he also is an extremely accomplished moderator. Alan arranged for the two of us to meet with two representatives from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Why the National Trust? Well, in 2002, the National Trust uh, listed Rosenwald Schools as one of the 11 most endangered historical places in the nation. And they went into partnerships with many organizations to help restore a great number of the still remaining Rosenwald Schools. At that meeting in July, 2016, we plotted a path forward. 
I have the first slide, please? As you know, I was a scientist, so I used to do a lot of PowerPoint slides. Um, now, top, please. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead. Um, uh, Michael, if you can get it to the first one, I'd appreciate it. The mission of the campaign is to establish a national historical park with a visitor center in Chicago and a small group of Rosenwald schools in their original locations. All of, you can leave it right there. All of which will be selected by the National Park Service. The first thing that the campaign did in early 2017 was to solicit recommendations of Rosenwald schools from the 15 states in which the nearly 5,000 schools were built between 1912 and 1932. 56 school facilities were nominated by 14 states. We had visited 34 facilities in 12 states before the COVID pandemic brought on a new reality. So this is the first, I'm gonna show you four schools that uh, among the 56 that were nominated and four schools that we visited. There was also a, a teacher home that was visited because part of the program was to build schools, teacher homes and shops. One teacher home was, was uh, recommended. This is the Cairo, not Cairo, but Cairo Reginald School. It's near Nashville in Tennessee. It is a one teacher uh, school. They had specific designs for the school. Note the windows, which are, which are the type that are used in Rosenwald schools. It's a way to identify them. And often there was a photo of Julius Rosenwald inside the schoolroom. May I have the next slide, please? Okay, this is the Scrabble School in Sperryville, uh, Virginia. It's near the entrance to um, Shenandoah National Park. It's, uh, it's one of the two teacher school models. That was the most commonly built school. Um, it has been restored. It is now a senior center, at least before COVID, and it has a small museum. You can see a photo of that. Um, and it, it has a very strong uh, support group. Next slide, please. This school, which we're about to see, it's Rosenwald Ridgely School. It's in Capitol Heights, Maryland. It's near the DC line. Like the Scrabble School, it's a two teacher school. It was, uh, it was, um, uh, enhanced in the 40s. It has been beautifully restored. It has within it, it's a museum and a, a community center, has within it a restored classroom, which you can see in the photo. Uh, it's the, the Prince George's alumni chapter of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority helped run this, um, the programs at the school. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the Dunbar, it's now called the Dunbar Middle Magnet, Magnet Middle School. It's in Little Rock, Arkansas. This has a very important civil rights history. It was designed by the same architects who designed Little Rock Central High School. Um, it, it's a big school, um, but unlike Central High School, it is not equal in the size or in the uh, 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 adornments. And it is still uh, operated as a school, as is Central High School. Central High School is now a national historical historic site. And this is only about a mile from Central High School. And it does show that it really the difference in terms of separate and unequal. Uh, importantly, many, most of the nine children who were the Little Rock, Rock Nine went to this school before they went over to Central High School to integrate it in 1957. Next slide, please. Okay, so another thing that the uh, campaign has accomplished is that we had a historic context study prepared for us in 2018. This is a, a photo of the cover of the report. That report concluded that Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools are of national historic significance and that a national historical park would be an important addition to the national park system. Next slide, please. Uh, we have another report that came out in August, 2020. It's a report on possible sites in Chicago for a visitor center. I'm gonna spend just a minute on that because this is the Illinois State Society and there are people who may be interested from Chicago. Uh, there were five sites that had, uh, were considered. The first at the top uh, on the 
report, report cover is the Sears administration building uh, from the Homan Square. And Howard talked about his father's grandfather connection to, uh, he may have even worked in this building. Um, and uh, most, of the, most of the plan is gone, but parts of it have been preserved. The second is the original Wabash Avenue YMCA in Chicago. Julius Rosenwald contributed 25,000 toward building that uh, YMCA for African-Americans. He believed in challenge grants. The third is the Museum of Science and Tech uh, Industry. And Julius Rosenwald was the, gave the founding donation to create that museum. And he insisted that his name not be added to the building. The, third, the fourth site is the South Side Community Art Center that is associated with the Rosenwald Fund. And the fifth is the Rosenwald Courts Apartment Complex in Bronzeville. It underwent an enormous restoration late, recently and it won a prestigious award for that restoration. So those are the five sites that we are considering at this point in time. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, the campaign also helped fund, you can see the, the historic marker that was placed in front of Rosenwald's boyhood home in Springfield, Illinois. As Howard mentioned, this home is part of the Lincoln Home National Historic Site is diagonally across the street from Abraham Lincoln's home. And the, um, the marker was dedicated on February 12, 2020. That was my last trip. I came home on Valentine's Day and then went into hiding. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, this is the Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools Act of 2020. Howard told you quite a bit about it. You know that it was sponsored in the, jointly in the House and Senate by Senator Durbin and Congressman Davis. Both senators in from Illinois, are uh, Senator Duckworth is a co-sponsor, and there were quite a few representatives from uh, Illinois who are also co-sponsors in the House. Both bills were bipartisan, and there were 44 co 43 co-sponsors in the House and nine in the Senate. And 40 organizations um, uh, also expressed official support for the uh, legislation. The two most prominent in the first two were National Parks Conservation Association and the National Trust. Uh, and you know that the bill was signed into law on January 13, um, less than a month ago. Uh, the campaign is now working to set up meetings with the National Park Service at which we will give them our reports and work with them to hopefully to see that the, the study um, uh, that is mandated by the report is done as expeditiously as possible. That the the um, it's mandated by the law. The law mandates that uh, the National Park Service conduct a special resource study of Julius Rose, the sites that are associated with Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools. And that study will be the first key step toward the legislation that ultimately creates the national park. This legislation does not create the national park. It would be great if it does, but it's an important staff step on that pathway. Uh, next slide. Okay, this, this um, we are also going from the sublime to the not very sublime. The campaign is collecting Rosenwald memorabilia that we will give to the national park when it's created. And it includes a Sears stereopticon and slide deck that Sears met, manufactured and sold to people. The slide deck and the slides, uh, the stereopticon and the slides originally sold for 50 cents. And this is from the time frame of 1906-1907. The vintage postcards of Sears. And then we, we now have three. This shows two uh, front pages from national newspapers that the day after Julius Rosenwald died, his death was front page news in those newspapers. In Chicago, the Chicago paper, it was the banner headline. Uh, it shows how important he was during his lifetime. Next slide, please. Uh, so we uh, have a number of subscribers. We have over 600 subscribers and we put out uh, quarterly newsletters and quarterly campaign updates and we will welcome new subscribers. And so if you would like to, we would love you to, please visit our website, www.rosenwaldpark.org. 
or uh, send an email to info at reservoirpark.org. Um, and then I would like, if you don't mind, to end the slides. And I have a few more things to say, and then I'll turn it back to Alan. Um, in conclusion, why should there be a Julius Rosenwald a park for Julius Rosenwald, a national park for New Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools? And why now? This is an extremely timely story about the son of German Jewish immigrants, a man who did not finish high school, but who went on to lead Sears Roebuck to its commanding position as a retailing empire in the early 20th century. He became wealthier than he ever dreamed of, benefiting enormously from the American democracy. Rosenwald believed in using his fortune to help others in need, especially African-Americans. He became a visionary philanthropist, helping to affect real change in the nation. The nation needs such stories now more than ever, even more than when the campaign began in 2016. They can help the nation heal itself and strive for the more perfect union and what better place to tell the story than in a new national park. Please join Team Rosenwald in making this a reality. Thank you very much. Dorothy, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. We'll go next to Aviva Kempner. I'll read a portion of her biography. <clears throat> uh, a child of Holocaust survivor, Helen Siesla, a Polish citizen, and Harold Kempner, a US Army officer. Kempner was born in Berlin, Germany after World War II. Her family history inspired her to create her first documentary, Partisans of Vilna in 1986. She grew up in Detroit and has a brother, Jonathan. Kempner lives in Washington, D.C. and is an activist for voting rights for the District of Columbia. She was a member of the class of 1976 at the Progressive Antioch School of Law. In 1981, Kempner founded the Siesla Foundation to produce films that investigate non-stereotypical images of Jews in history and celebrate the untold stories of Jewish heroes. In 1986, Kempner conceived and produced Partisans of Vilna, a documentary on Jewish resistance against the Nazis. She co-founded the Washington Jewish Film Festival in 1989 together with Miriam Morsel Nathan and served as the festival's founding director. Kempner made Rosenwald in 2015, a feature length historical documentary about businessman and philanthropist Julius Rosenwald who partnered with Booker T. Washington and African-American communities to build over 5,000 schools in the Jim Crow South. The Rosenwald Fund also provided grants to support a who's who of African-American artists and intellectuals. Aviva, thank you for being with us. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. And thanks to Alan and Howard for arranging uh, today's program. I have to say, I grew up in Detroit, as you just heard. So I'm a, I feel like a fellow Midwesterner and I bet there's a lot of you that are listening that pronounce Coca-Cola pop. So I have to say, make, that's my one joke of uh, connecting. But I'm also very excited because I have not left Chicago. My new film on imagining the Indians about Native American mascotting includes the Chicago uh, hockey team. I don't want to mention its name. But also I'm now making a film on Ben Hecht, who for many years was a Chicago newspaper man. So Chicago is always um, in my uh, professional career. Um, people often ask me, how did you get inspired to make a film on Julius Rosenwald? And after all, it's a story of a hundred years ago. And I'm so excited because Dorothy was inspired by me, but I wanna tell you how I was inspired. And that has to do with the fact that 18 years ago, I was on Martha's Vineyard and I went to a lecture at the Hebrew Center uh, booked as Jews and Blacks. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to hear about the civil rights era. And part of the reason I went, because Rabbi David Saperstein was there, who had been the, the, the head of the RAC, of the reform movement's office here in Washington, but someone who I idolized from following his career for years, and it was the great civil rights activist, Julian Bond. So I'm sitting there and all of a sudden Julian gets up and he starts talking about Julius Rosenwald, the schools, 
the other things he did, the fact that his father and his uncle all got grants. And it was like a light bulb went off in my head. And I said, my gosh, I have to do this. And sure enough, um, I did the film. It was finished in 2015. And just like Dorothy mentions that it's very interesting that it's even more pertinent now. I'm still going around with the film. Um, and if you go to the website, rosemaldfilm.org, I'm still going around with the film all over the country and people are even more interested than before. And I'm very lucky and you're lucky today to have Stephanie talking because there are two very important books. Uh, Stephanie's book about the relationship between Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington, because what really inspired him were two things. Julius Rosenwald was that he had a rabbi, Rabbi Hirsch, Emil Hirsch, who was an activist rabbi and also one who preached something in our Judaism called Tukum Alone, that you have to repair the world. And he would hear his lectures and be very inspired both in his giving in Chicago and in Illinois and later on, and I don't wanna take away from what Stephanie's gonna talk about. And so uh, Rosenwald decided I've gotta do something. And it also has to do with the fact that Sadaka, giving charity is also very important to Judaism. And it is not a coincidence that in his own life, he would live on a third of it, save a third and give away a third. And sort of that matching principle really worked with a lot of his giving. Um, and you know, my film, when it came out in 2015, was dedicated to Black Lives Matter. And by the way, it's statehood now, it's just not voting rights for DC, Allen. Um, I think you have an old, uh, uh, what do you call it, resume for me. But in any event, I think what's fascinating to me is, and I'll leave the school story for Stephanie to say, but I will mention one thing because I have a master's in urban planning, is there are two things that happen when he, uh, one important thing between Rosenwald and Booker T. When it came to designing the schools, I think Rosenwald very understandably said, well, we'll just use the, the kid houses we have here at Sears. And Booker T said, no, we're gonna build the schools here. It's so much about black self-determination. And I always like to say, it's not Rosenwald building for the black community, it's Rosenwald working with the black community. And the other thing is, it was green architecture before there's green architecture. Dorothy just showed you the windows and I can't tell you how wonderful it is to visit one of these sites especially the restored schools. What's, uh, I would like to spend the rest of my time just mentioning some of the things that Rosenwald did right in Chicago that you can still visit today. You know, uh, the late John Lewis who went to a Rosenwald school as you can see in the uh, trailer of the film always had this line, when you see something, do something. And hopefully when you see the film or Howard had uh, talked about renting it for the society in the future, um, Rosenwald will drive home, drive from home to the Sears building and he would see how crowded Chicago was in the teens because of the great migration. And he said, oh, I should, I should just build some housing. And my other line was about him is whenever he went to Europe, which he took his kids during the summer to Germany because that's where the family was from, he would have ideas architecturally of what to do back. Uh, in Chicago. And sure enough, if you look at the Michigan Garden Apartments, it's based on a design, uh, maybe he saw in Vienna, I'm not sure, you know, it's been a while since I had all the facts in my head. And I really can't recommend uh, better than going to see the revitalization of the Michigan Garden Apartments. They're called the Rosenwald Flats. And if you wanna see even sort of the continuation uh, we mentioned Obama, uh, Howard mentioned Obama earlier. Uh, it's Barbara Bowman who talks about growing up in the flats because it's her great uh, gr grandfather that designed the schools, but it's her father that was running, uh, Robert Taylor, Robert Taylor Jr. that were running um, the Michigan Garden Apartments. And her daughter is Valerie Jarrett, who was the domestic advisor to President Obama. Um, the other thing that was, fascinating to me that I really learned and you as members of the fair state of Illinois 
is how important the Chicago Renaissance was at the same time the Harlem Renaissance was happening. Very comparable. And in the film, there's a, a great section about Gordon Parks. And as a matter of fact, if you order the DVD, which you can, on the, um, you can get a copy of the film, but there's also four and a half hours of bonus features, which include, again, some of the artists that were supported um, by the Rosenwald Fund. And I'm gonna end this with one story. As you can see behind me, the, the self-portrait is, I'm the daughter of an artist. My mother was an expressionist, abstract expressionist painter. And the one story that really hits me more than anything in the film is the story of Augusta Savage, who actually was part of the Har Harlem Renaissance and taught many people like Jacob Lawrence, who migration series was actually supported by the Rosenwald Fund. And in 39, she, uh, she had the commission to do a wonderful sculpture called the Harp at uh, the, World's, the World uh, Fair. And here's actually a replica of it. It's based on the spiritual lift up every voice and sing the Negro spiritual. Well, can you imagine she had, everyone loved it and they made miniatures like this. I, I bought one and uh, in recent times and she did not have the money to bring it back home, which I think is just one of the most appalling stories. So I'm hoping after the park is all funded that I've written a piece in the New York Times, you can get on my web website or look it up that, you know, we talk a lot about destroying statues, but I think we also should talk about establishing statues and who knows, maybe at the park, my idea is to have it in Florida where she lived in Queens where it originally was at the African-American Museum here. And he doesn't know it yet, but for President Obama to have it at his library, but who knows, Alan, maybe it should be at one of the parks. So anyhow, I wanna give you over to Stephanie because she like Peter Askley, who's the grandson of Rosenwald, they both wrote, wrote two books that made all the difference in me making the film. Aviva, thank you so much for those remarks. Uh, we're going to go next to Stephanie Deutsch. Let me read her biography. Uh, Stephanie Deutsch is the author of You Need a Schoolhouse, Booker T. Washington, Julius Rosenwald, and the Building of Schools for the Segregated South. And let me give you a thorough endorsement for that book. It's a really great read. Published in 2011 by Northwestern University Press. She was a speaker at two at the two National Rosenwald School Conferences sponsored by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, has visited more than two dozen Rosenwald schools and has shared the story with alumni of the schools, church groups, and high school students. Her husband, David Deutsch, is the great grandson of Julius Rosenwald. She holds a bachelor's degree from Brown University and a master's degree in Soviet Union era studies from Harvard University. And what's missing from this bio is reference to, is it three or five grandchildren of whom you are particularly fond? Actually, Alan, it's seven. Seven. <laughs> Stephanie Deutsch. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be with you all. And as you can probably tell, the, the Rosenwald circuit has brought us all together, uh, not just as colleagues, but as friends. There's something about the spirit of what Julius Rosenwald did that um, seems to still be alive. And I think about this often when I visit schools or um, when I talk on the phone, as I did this week with someone whose great grand, great uncle worked at Tuskegee and and the connections are still happening. So the contribution he made was really, um, really significant. Um, and as you know, you've heard about, of course, his, his intense um, connection to Chicago. Some of you may have seen the bust of him outside the Chicago Merchandise Mart. Um, Julius Rosenwald was a son of German Jewish immigrants, but he was also very much a son of Illinois and um, of Chicago. His parents, Samuel Rosenwald and Augusta Hammerslow Rosenwald, came from Germany, Prussia actually, Northern Germany, and they moved in the summer of 1861 to Springfield, Illinois, to run a branch of Augusta's brother's clothing business. And uh, they really needed help there because uh, business was booming with um, uniforms, providing uniforms for the army that was that was forming then in um, 1861. And so Julius was born in Springfield on August 12th, 1862. Um, 
his biographer, Peter Askely, who, who um, Aviva mentioned, who is his grandson and who lives in Chicago, makes a point that the Julius Rosenwald story is not a rags to riches story. He grew up, his parents certainly arrived in this country without much money, but the time he was growing up, they were solidly middle-class. And Michael, we have a picture of the house uh, where he grew up. Uh, and as you've heard, it was um, across the street from Abraham Lincoln's home. Uh, so this is where Julius Rosenwald grew up. Uh, typical childhood, uh, parents, five brothers and sisters working in his father's shop on weekends, um, having a bar mitzvah when he was 13 at the synagogue that his father had helped establish. Um, but he did not get the chance to graduate from high school. When he was 16, he left Chicago, he left Springfield and moved to New York where he was apprenticed with his mother's brothers who had expanded what they were doing um, from retail, they had gone into manufacturing and they were manufacturing men's clothing. And I'm sure you all, many of you remember that in the late 19th century, this was the rag trade, this was huge. And so Julius and his brother Morris spent several years there living together, working with their uncles. And when they decided to go into business for themselves, uh, they decided to uh, not do it in New York where they'd be in competition with their uncles, but to move back to the Midwest, um, to Chicago, which was a booming town then and a transportation hub and was a very good place um, for them to, uh, to be and to start business. Oh yeah, you can take that away now, uh, Michael. Um, in 1895, Julius had the, made the decision that made him a wealthy man. And um, this has a nice Illinois uh, connection. Uh, Julius's brother-in-law, by now he's married, Augusta Nussbaum, also the daughter of immigrants. Aaron Nussbaum had made a small fortune selling flavored soda water at the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition. Remember the World's Fair that was called the White City. And uh, Aaron was a little unsure about how to invest this money. And he was invited by Richard Sears who had started a small unknown mail order company. And he was a feeling a little insecure about it. And he invited his brother-in-law Julius to become part of the deal. And Julius Rosenwald later wrote that it took him five minutes to decide that mail order was a business uh, with the future. And I think having experienced, as we all have, the transformation in shopping that occurred with the internet in the last 20 or so years, we can appreciate what mail order did for rural America at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. It was huge. Sears sold everything from baby booties to tombstones with books and seeds and farm equipment in between and houses as, as Aviva mentioned. And to Richard Sears' flair for marketing, you heard a little bit about that in the film clip that he was a marketer of genius. Julius added expert management and Sears became one of the largest retailers in America. So as a newly wealthy man, uh, Rosenwald bought a big house. By that time he had, uh, he was married and had five children. And he took the first of his many trips to Europe where he reconnected with his, um, relatives there, but he also began thinking seriously about sharing his wealth. And Aviva talked about, about how foundational in his thinking, the Jewish concepts were tzedakah, giving that um, is based on a sense of righteousness and giving that doesn't just help in a temporary kind of way, but strengthens the person who receives the gift. Um, he was also influenced by um, Jane Addams, who was uh, in Chicago at the time, having founded Hull House, and by his rabbi uh, that Aviva mentioned, Emil Hirsch, who was preaching what I like to call sort of uh, a Jewish version of the social gospel, a very activist uh, approach to, to faith and religion. Um, so these things were influential on uh, Julius, but another big influence was uh, in about 1908, 1909, he was given a copy of Up From Slavery, which of course was Booker T. Washington's memoir of growing up and of uh, founding Tuskegee 
and it was, um, it is an extraordinarily powerful story. And um, one of the main themes was the hunger for education that existed in the wake of slavery. Um, and Julius began to see a connection between um, Jews and African-Americans. Um, that first race riot that occurred in Springfield in 1908, that was his hometown. And he began to kind of make a connection between violence against African-Americans, violence against Blacks, and what was happening in Europe with pogroms um, against Jews. Uh, and he even explicitly said in a speech, uh, we look down on the Russians for the way they treat their Jews, but the way what we're doing to black people in this country is no better. Um, so 1910, 1911, 1912, Julius reaches a turning point. And when he's asked to donate to a white YMCA, he says, no, I don't think so. But if you want to come to me about giving money for black YMCAs, let's talk. And so he stunned the people who came to talk to him by saying, I'll give $25,000 to any city in America that can raise $75,000 and we'll build black YMCAs. And ultimately 27 facilities were built all across the country. And these were you know, places where people could stay, uh, very significant for the black community. In 1911, he meets Booker T. Washington. And uh, I can almost remember the aha moment I had when I realized these two guys were so different in background, but in many ways, they were rather similar. They were both very pragmatic and very action oriented. And um, Julius took uh, Booker T. Washington to visit the Sears plant. And so Booker T. Washington said, okay, you gotta come down and visit Tuskegee. And so in October of 1911, Julius Rosenwald assembled a big group of people. Jane Adams was one, uh, Rabbi Hirsch was one, and they took a private train car down to Tuskegee and visited, okay, you can give us the slide now, um, and visited uh, Tuskegee and were incredibly impressed by what they saw there. And Julius Rosenwald agreed to serve on the board of Tuskegee. Um, and uh, here are the two men uh, on the campus of Tuskegee. Um, and then in 1912, in honor of his 50th birthday, Julius Rosenwald gave away over $600,000. Uh, this is about 16 million in today's dollars, I believe. Um, 25,000 of this was to Tuskegee. And um, it was Booker T. Washington, having concocted this plan with some of his staff who suggested how about if we take 2,500 of that and use it to build small schools in the area around Tuskegee? And Washington, excuse me, Washington really got Rosenwald's attention when he explained to him that in these small rural communities, people were already raising money to build schools. They desperately wanted schools. Public education was mandatory, but the states were devising their money very unequally between their black and white communities. And in rural areas, there were many places where there were simply were no schools. So uh, they built six schools. Okay, you can uh, show the next slide. Um, this is one of the very early schools. This is the Chiha School. Um, and I particularly like this picture, the way the children are lined up outside the school. And you can see how rural it is. Um, so from that humble beginning came a program which grew quickly. Both men's offices were swamped with people writing to say, how can, my, how can I get a school? How can my community get a school? Um, they quickly agreed to do a hundred more schools. Booker T. Washington died in 1915. Two years later, Rosenwald established the Rosenwald Fund, which he based in Nashville, Tennessee to, to continue the project of building schools. And between 1912, when the first schools were built and 1932, when Rosenwald died, they built over 5,000 schoolhouses, uh, teachers homes and shop buildings across 15 states of the American South, most of them small schools like this one in very rural areas. Um, an important fact about the schools, they're public. It was part of the genius of the program that they didn't create private schools that would need endless fundraising to stay in business. They 
managed, they connected the schools to the public school system. And um, so they were public schools, which the public facilities donated the largest amount of money. But dollar for dollar, African Americans in the communities the schools were built to serve donated more than the Rosenwald Fund. Uh, and because the schools were in communities where public facilities were really uh, off limits to African Americans. They couldn't use the library. They couldn't use the playing fields. Uh, they couldn't, they could, had no place to gather. The schools became tremendous sources of pride and affection in the communities where they were built. And the program that you heard a little bit about to preserve the schools very much reflects this extraordinary um, sense of pride. Um, between 1928 and 1948, um, you heard a little from Aviva about how the most important program of the Rosenwald Fund was the fellowships that they gave to emerging writers, dancers, and scholars in all fields from agriculture to economics. Um, one last slide. Um, one of the very last fellowships given went to um, a young artist named Jacob Lawrence to uh, support his work as he created the migration series. So Rosenwald's commitment was to invest not in buildings, not in art, not in anything that would perpetuate his ideas or his name. His commitment was to invest in people. And he did that by providing encouragement to rural African-American communities with educational op opportunity to one third of the black children in the South in the years leading up to desegregation and by supporting um, important uh, artists and scholars. Rosenwald believed that properly provided with education and opportunity, these people could and would help address the problems of our country, as indeed so many of them have. And um, with that, I will uh, leave it and, and uh, hand it over to, to Alan to hand it over to Bob. <laughs> Stephanie, thank you so much. Um, we're going to go next to um, Bob Stanton. Uh, Mr. Stanton is former senior advisor to the Secretary of the U.S. Department of the Interior and former director of the National Park Service. As the 15th director of the National Park Service, he was also the first African American to be confirmed into this position. Um, he is a visiting professor at Yale, Howard, and Texas A&M Universities. And during the period from 2001 to 2003, he also served as the International Union for Conservation and Nature Ambassador for the Fifth World Parks Congress, held in 2003 in Durban, South Africa. He's also a valued member of this campaign team. Bob, we'll turn it over to you. Unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Alan, for your, your very kind introduction. And uh, let me hasten to uh, thank the uh, sponsors of this discussion on truly an American hero. And I would be the first to uh, submit uh, that the life and legacy of Mr. Julius Rosenwald uh, deserve to be commemorated and preserved perpetually in your national park system. So it's a professional as well as a personal honor and pleasure for me to be a part of the Rosenwald Park campaign. I'm a direct beneficiary of his leadership and his benevolence in that uh, I grew up in segregated Texas and I know firsthand the importance of equal access to educational opportunities. And certainly his contributions uh, to uh, the fight for the desegregation of public schools, his donation to the NAACP uh, that successfully uh, uh, gave the resources that Thurgood Marshall and his colleagues to prepare the case that they argued before the US Supreme Court in which it handed down its uh, watershed decision in 1954, declaring that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. And as I have looked at uh, the, the lay of the land that Stephanie and others have so eloquently described in terms of the 5,000 plus schools 
built throughout 15 states with support facilities for the teachers and the shops. Such a rich, rich story. And there were over 400 of these schools built in my, my segregated home state of Texas. Uh, so I know that many of my relatives and distant relatives, my extended family, uh, were members of the uh, faculty and member of the student body that attended to some of these uh, 400 schools throughout the state of Texas. So again, I want to thank the sponsors of, uh, of, of this discussion. And I'm hoping that uh, the, the word, if you will, that the fact that the uh, president has signed a, a piece of legislation that authorized the uh, secretary of the interior uh, to conduct uh, this study. And I'm sure that Dorothy mentioned this earlier when I was disconnected, unfortunately. So these are some very exciting times and it's up to us now to carry out the work. But I, uh, I just wanna share one other perspective on uh, the uh, importance of Mr. Rosenwald, his leadership and his contribution. And I've been thinking a great deal about uh, the constitution of the United States of America. And for somehow I believe, I really believe that Mr. Rosenwald understood and perhaps even felt ashamed that we as a people and as a nation had made a commitment through the enactment of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, that all citizens would be protected or would have equal protection of the laws. That's the exact language, protection of the laws. And then lo and behold, in the Plessy versus Ferguson case, handed down by the Supreme Court, in 1896, declaring, declaring that it would be constitutional for us to live separate but equal. That doctrine, that doctrine resulted in our enacting all kinds of Jim Crow's laws, staunchly segregating ourselves, not only in public schools, but throughout our other institutions. And I really believe that Mr. Rosenwald felt that I, as one individual, can do something to try to live up to the spirit of equal protection of the law. And I know, I know that education is a prime, is of prime importance to all, and particularly to those who were being by design deprived of this opportunity. I think it was really one of his motivations. Also, I don't know, and maybe Stephanie is something we can look at, is whether or not Mr. Rosenwald was in the audience in 1893, I believe, at the Columbian, at the World Columbian Exposition in Chicago. When my man, when my man, Mr. Douglas said that, uh, and there was a lot of discussion about the Negro problem, and Mr. Douglas said, there's no Negro problem. The problem is whether we as a people have the loyalty enough, the patriotism enough, and the courage enough to live up to our own constitution. And I believe that Mr. Rosewall said to himself, yes, I'm gonna do my bit to live up to the constitution because we guarantee equal protection of the laws. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rosenwald was setting standards for us to follow if in fact we believe in the principles of democracy and equal opportunity for all. Again, it's my pleasure to be a part of this and I look forward to the day when we will join with whomever is the president at that time and maybe the current president to cut the ribbon and dedicate a national park in the honor of Julian Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools. That would be an American thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I appreciate uh, my appreciation to all our panelists. We've got time for just a handful of questions. 
so let's start with one from uh, Deborah Greenberg. And the question is, please tell us if any of you are aware of how Rosenwald's story has been used to influence and inspire corporate leaders of diversity initiatives in our era of civil rights 2.0 as the new chairman of Starbucks, Melody Hobson, an African-American woman calls it. Any thoughts on that? I, I have one thought very briefly, Alan. I, I think it's unfortunate uh, that uh, Mr. Rosenwald's leadership, his concepts of leadership, his concept of providing support, financial or in-kind services and what have you, uh, are, is a textbook, are a textbook, a, a textbook in terms of how to uh, uh, support uh, diversity and inclusion. But the unfortunate thing is that not as many people know about uh, his leadership style, his concept and his successes. And I think with the uh, National Park that will be brought to the attention of corporate America as well as the nonprofit organizations in fostering their own diversity and uh, inclusion programs. He has set some standards. Um, Alan? Um, I think that, um, you know, the campaign would welcome support from any and all um, foundations, corporations to get a Julius Rosenwald story more broadly known. As has been said, he was a modest man. He didn't want his name uh, put on buildings. Um, and he believed that his uh, philanthropy should be be during his lifetime. He believed in give while you live. So he's now perhaps the most famous philanthropist that nobody has heard of. And we're working to correct that. And we will welcome support from any organization that is interested in it. And we will also get the story out because this park is important to be created and put in our national park system. And I just want to mm -hmm. add, that's why I'm working so hard to get a streaming deal for the film. So it inspires. And I try to send DVDs to everyone. I'm like some, someone like Mackenzie Scott. Her generosity to me uh, reminds me, especially how she's hel helping the historical black colleges. But I want to tell a story very fast that I forgot to say in my talk. So years ago, when I was making the film, I decided to visit the family home in Springfield. And I called the National Parks. And I said, the Rosenwald home is Kitty Corner across. And whoever I was talking to the Park Service, they said, well, we'll look for where it is, but we don't know where it is. So Peter Askely, the grandson and I go down, we get off the train, we go into the office. And they say, you know what, you're sitting in it. We didn't realize that our offices was the Rosenwald um, family house. So I feel good. I mean, I love the park service, but I really feel good that we were able to do that. And, you know, you mentioned about the segregation of schools. Some of the footage in our film was taken by Third Good Marshall, assisting Charles Hamilton Houston, who were doing the legal work on the desegregation. And where were they doing it? Right. In the 12th Street Y, that Rosenwald had come from Chicago on a train to give the to look at it to give the final money, and he didn't even go to the White House for lunch. That's how modest. Yeah. He was. <laughs> Good and point. And the Museum of Science and Industry that had been the building from that exposition uh, you're talking about, he created. Yes. It, you know, and made That's it. That's correct. So, like like I said, you see something, you do something. That's what Rosenwald was about. I want to try to squeeze in one last question here. Stephanie, I think this is going to be for you. Did Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington socialize with their families? Well, yes, they did. Um, uh, when Booker T. Washington uh, came to sh Chicago in 1912, he stayed at the uh, Rosenwald home. And one of the most sort of thrilling moments of my research was when I introduced, when I interviewed Rosenwald's youngest child, Uncle Bill, known to my family as Uncle Bill. He was then over 90. And he said he remembered when Booker T. Washington came to his house, he was a little boy and uh, stayed there for a week. And I said to him, well, gosh, what, what was that like? And he said, well, I just wondered why he and my father spent so much time um, 
in, in my dad's office together. Um, and I like to think, well, they were kind of hammering out the plan to create the Rosenwald schools. Um, but then there was one more detail, which just um, astonished me. Booker T. Washington sent a thank you letter to Julius and his wife, thanking them for the hospitality. He said he enjoyed, I think he said a season of refreshment and uh, encouragement or something. Uh, and at the end of the letter, he said, P.S. I'm returning your house key to you. I thoughtlessly walked away with it. Um, <laughs> so they were, they were on terms of, um, you know, those were formal times. They always called each other Mr. Mr. Rosenwald and Dr. Washington. But uh, Washington was a guest in the Rosenwald home. The Rosenwalds visited Tuskegee almost every year for many, many years. And at one point, Gussie, Julius's wife, wrote a letter to the president of Tuskegee saying, I feel homesick for Tuskegee. Um, mm. it, it, it was a strong relationship. And uh, I'd like to add, mm -hmm. I believe that Julius Rosenwald spoke at the funeral for Booker T. Washington. And I think if I'm correct, that Mrs. Washington uh, kept him informed about uh, Booker T. Washington's rapidly declining health and his death from, um, you know, hypertension. Well, folks, um, I just want to say thank you again for joining us uh, and providing such great insights into the life and legacy of Julius Rosenwald. Our guest today, Aviva Kempner, uh, her film Rosenwald uh, is something that you need to see. Stephanie Deutsch, author of You Need a Schoolhouse um, and a part of this campaign, Bob Stanton, formerly the director of the National Park Service and a vital part of this campaign. And Dorothy Cantor, the catalyst for all this action uh, um, to support the advancement of a uh, national park concept designation for Julius Rosenwald. So thank you all for being with us. Howard, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to close us out, sir. Yeah, Alan, thank you so much. And thank you to the, our dynamite panel here for your work and for Michael administering this uh, amazing program. Um, I have Stephanie's book here, You Need a Schoolhouse. It is a great read. So go on Sears, uh, Sears uh, Successor, Amazon.com yep. to, to get this book. It's wonderful. Aviva's uh, movie. There we go. Uh, Rosenwall, another book, uh, Rosenwall. Um, and Aviva's movie, uh, go on her website, um, get those DVDs, whatever. Um, and uh, I know my grandfather, a blessed memory, would have been very proud to know that he worked for JR, for Julius Rosenwald. After hearing this program today, I know that my grandfather, Harry Marks, would have been very proud to have been employed by a man by the name of Julius Rosenwald. Um, so we're not done with the, in the Illinois State Society Black History Month, it's just not one month out of the year. We're working right now with the African-American Civil War Museum here in Washington, DC, the U Street Corridor. We're very much involved with the museum. They're gonna be rededicating a new building later this year. And we're gonna be very active participants in that rededication. Um, and this uh, program will, has been recorded. It will appear on our website. Again, Illinois State Society of Washington, DC. You have to put in Washington, D.C. because there's another group that says similar name. Huh. Illinois State Society of Washington, D.C. The recording will be posted within 24 hours. So with that, we'll conclude. And we had almost 100 people on the call today. That's a record for us. We are so proud that you took time out of your day. We know that I heard up on Capitol Hill there might be a competing event. So... <laughs> So thank you so much for spending uh, part of your afternoon with us. That's why we look forward to other calls. We're, uh, we're going to be doing a lot of work with the Illinois congressional delegation. You already heard about the great work done by Senator Durbin and, Sen and Representative Davis. We're going to be uh, having Zoom calls and interviews with as many of members of the Illinois congressional delegation as we can, plus other awesome programs. So with that, I will say good afternoon. Again, thank you to our panel. Thank you very much, Alan, for the great job you did moderating. Again, Michael, great job. And with that, we'll close this out. So much, thank you so much, and good evening.
Thank you, Mark.